Welcome back! As you may or may not know, I am Eli, the computer guy, and this is a video for The Daily Blob. So The Daily Blob is basically where I come and I talk about topics in the world of technology and try to explain things from, you know, the eyes of somebody that's been doing this for almost 30 years now. Ridiculous. Started in the Army in 1996 in electronics and... Well, I'm doing whatever the hell it is that I'm doing now. But I think that this is interesting. This is an interesting story to talk about because I hear about this in the real world, right? There's the online world with online discourse that's just complete and utter insanity. And then there's like the reals world, the real world where people are talking and people making decisions and so on and so forth. And so ma many times uh, when we hear about hot takes or we hear sound bites or whatever else, everybody online is all like, ah! and people in the real world just don't care. Again, I will remind people, even at its height, even at its height, Twitter, uh, as far as the U.S. population is concerned, only about 20% of Americans uh, actually had like an account on Twitter or signed in uh, every month or like like literally like went to uh, Twitter, uh, you know, once in a month. Uh, but there's this idea that everybody is on Twitter. And it's just like, no, they're, they're not. <laughs> so you get all these big Twitter arguments. Again, the politicians get into it and the journalists get into it. All these people are like, roar! The American people care about this. And then the American people are just trying to pay their damn mortgage. <laughs> Let me be clear. Do you know what the American people care about? their mortgage. Regardless of your color, your sex, your sexual identity, your religion, or any of those other things, uh, getting to being able to pay your mortgage is becoming harder and harder and harder. Medical care is becoming more and more expensive. Child care is a complete and utter disaster. But again, if you look at the social media world, you think flags. Flags are the most important thing. But anyways, this is an interesting thing that's going on in the real world. That's why I want to talk about it, because I've actually been hearing from real technology professionals, real coders, how coding is dead. AI has already killed coding. Shocker. I kind of find all this whole discussion to be a bit funny. Again, having done technology for 30 years, seeing people all like, ah, about AI right now destroying the tech sector, I just find it to be a little bit hilarious. And I want to talk about it today because this is what is bubbling up into the mainstream. Again, not just what's on the Twitterverse, but what people are actually talking about, having real conversations about, and making real decisions around. And one of the big problems that I see in the tech industry nowadays is, you know how there's, there's this narrative. There's this narrative. The narrative is that like tech professionals are visionaries and they're risk takers, and they're people that go out there and they change the world. They risk everything to change the world. That's the narrative. That's the narrative. That's the tech industry I know and love that I haven't seen for a long, long time. I miss that tech industry. Remember that tech industry? Yeah, if you're under 20, no, you don't. No, you don't. Right? That's the narrative that people go by, right? The people in the tech world, they're just playing 5D chess or whatever else. And the reality is, is most people in the tech industry are really, really, really damn lame. And think about it, right? Before you, before you start smacking me on that, just think about this. Think about San Francisco. Think about Seattle. And think about Austin. And think, right? Like these, these were cool places. These were amazing places. There was art and there was music and there were free thinkers and all that kind of stuff. And then you had these tech companies who wanted to be associated with those types of people. And so they move in. And then they press all those people out. And then they don't support the community worth a damn. And now they're garbage places. I mean, just like, like, if you really want to think about the absolute abject disaster of the tech industry, look at San Francisco, Seattle, and Austin, and you, you'll see. Yeah, we all kind of, we suck. <laughs> we suck. 
<laughs> we go to cool places and destroy them, right? Because again, there isn't actually visionary and all that kind of stuff. That is just a narrative that's been pushed along. Tech people are by and large dirt, boring people. <laughs> they are people that want to sit in, in front of computer screens. Again, they are people that want Apple Vision Pro. Like they think Vision Pro is an improvement. How effed in the head do you have to be to think that that's gonna make the world better. Oh yeah, you know, it'd be great. You know, we're so isolated now and we're lacking community and all of that. So, so the solution's gonna be to suction cup a 4K monitor to our face. <laughs> so our computer screen never leaves us. I mean, you do, you do, you like literally realize <laughs> these people are pushing that as a solution. They're horrible people. They're horrible, horrible, horrible people. But anyways, why I bring this up is one of the big issues we have is since people in the tech industry are not visionaries, they are not making the world a better place, they are not pushing the envelope, they are not risk takers or any of that. Basically, I used to call them uh, computer flippers, right? You used to have hamburger flippers back in the day. Nowadays, we have a lot of computer flippers. And they learned Node.js, and so ergo, they're smart. It's like, no, bucko, you just learned Node.js. God bless you. Take all the money you get. I'm not going to snark on you for your paycheck. You take that paycheck to the bank. And I don't know, buy some art. <laughs> buy some art. Buy a personality. How about that? But the problem is, right? We get people into, like, there's this, this group thing that goes on. And so when things come through the tech industry, what you find is that people start going lockstep. Right, these visionary individuals can start going lockstep to basically say what everybody else is saying, right? We saw this with cryptocurrencies and blockchain. Again, blockchain. Blockchain is gonna change the world. <laughs> yeah, when, when's that gonna happen? You know, Bitcoin. Bitcoin just got back to like $64,000 of Bitcoin. See? I still don't know what I'll use Bitcoin for. <laughs> but it's worth $64,000, Eli. Yeah, but what, what am I going to use it for? I don't... I know what Vindimo is for. I know what, uh, you know, Apple Pay and Google Pay or Google Wallet and all that's for. I'm still at a bit of a loss of what I'm supposed to use a Bitcoin for. Other than make money for some reason, right? But anyways, you get this lock step. This is a feature again. VR and Bitcoin and this crap and that crap and the other horse crap. And so one of the things we're hearing now is again, everybody's going lock step, lock step, all right? And don't learn to code. The coding, you know, industry is dead. I want to talk about that, all right? And so we get that. We get this Jensen Huang, right? So Jensen Huang is a CEO of NVIDIA and he's coming out to say coding is dead. And how can I possibly argue with that? Because again, that's one thing we know. One thing we know in the tech industry <laughs> is, right, the people at the highest heights that are the richest of rich, they know everything and should absolutely never be questioned. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, what, that's what Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs knew. That's what Bill Gates knew back in the day. Do not question Xerox. That's, that's what a visionary would say. But anyways, right, so he's coming out, and he's saying, don't learn to code. NVIDIA's founder, Jensen Huang, advises a different career path. Let me scroll down. Uh, NVIDIA, the longtime graphics car company turned AI giant, joined the U.S. $1 trillion valuation club last year and is now just $50 million shy of $2 trillion following the surge in demand for its accelerator cards that large language models like ChatGPT are trained on. Now this is going to be one of the warnings I'm going to tell you in life. They have a product. Again, a good product. I ain't, I ain't got a snark on their GPUs, right? NVIDIA's got great GPUs, and they're now worth $2 trillion because everybody's, right, pushing these large language models with AI, and they're using the chips that NVIDIA is putting out. Be careful. Be careful with those kinds of companies. When you have one product, essentially one product line, and that's what makes you your $2 trillion, um, what happens when a competitor pops up? 
Or what happens when people just shift into a different direction? Uh, what happens to that $2 trillion valuation? Anyways, just something to think about there. So they're $2 trillion. You got to listen to them. $2 trillion. Uh, it's billion, multi-billionaire co-founder and CEO, Jensen Huang, is now one of the richest people in the world with a net worth of close to 70 US billion dollars and one that is the most sought after to speak about the future that his company is helping to build. One of the interesting things, again, you see in America nowadays, <laughs> well, you got to listen. He's smart. He's worth $70 billion. Are you worth $70 billion, Eli? No, I'm not worth $70 billion. But just because they're worth $70 billion, again, that doesn't necessarily mean you got to go lockstep with the things that they're talking about. The other interesting thing here is he's the most sought after speaker about the future that his company is helping build. So remember, whenever this guy talks, he is going to talk about a future whose foundation simply needs a metric crap ton of GPUs. Right? Like, think about this. If you're worth $70 billion and you're the head of a $2 trillion company, are you going to come out and go, eh? You know, AI, <laughs> I mean, AI is interesting and all, but maybe people are putting a little bit too much emphasis on this. Are you going to come out and say that? Or are you going to come out and say, buy more of my GPUs? Again, like it shouldn't come as a shock. Now, he was one of the headline guests at the World Government Summit in Dubai, which concluded a few days ago. At the event, he spoke at length about the future of the world in this new AI reality, including its impact it's going to have on our careers going forward. According to Jensen, the mantra of learning to code or teaching your kids how to program or even pursue a career in computer science, which was so dominant over the past 10 to 15 years, has now been thrown out the window. It hasn't been de-emphasized. It hasn't lost a bit of its value. Thrown out the window. You're already a programmer. Right? Uh, perhaps a bit paradoxically, the recent achievements of the IT industry are leading it to automate itself first, thereby reducing the need for tech experts and the number of tech jobs in the long run. Um, uh, re recent achievements here? Again, and this is something that's interesting to think about with the tech industry. Oh, wow, you mean, you mean that the IT industry has been automating and becoming more efficient, and that started um, re recently, apparently. Uh, what is your term for recent? This is your term for recent 20 years ago? Is your term for recent 15 years ago? Is your term for recent AWS, CloudFront, a Puppet, Chef, Ansible? Because that's what I'm sure they're talking about here. I'm sure when they're talking about automating systems and making them more efficient in the recent time frames, I guarantee you they're talking about Ansible here. And I kind of find this to be funny. Again, this is one of the things I've talked about for a long time about the tech industry. Is again, that is part of our job. Making things more efficient. Automating things so that you do not need so many employees. Again, I've talked about this before. It was uh, uh, Interop, Interop New York, circa let's say 2012 time frame, which was 12 years. That's ridiculous. 12 years ago. 12. I'm sitting in Interop New York, going through the watching the keynote presentation, and I've talked about this before. When the guy comes up and he's CIO of this company, and he talks about through efficiency that they've been, they were able to quadruple the employee count of their company and at the exact same time decrease the headcount of their IT staff by 25%. Because, again, with virtualization back there, Hyper-V, VMware, Citrix, a whole bunch of the other stuff, they were, hmm, able to make things more efficient and automate things, be reducing the need uh, for, for that type of tech employee. Which is kind of weird when you think about it. Well, that was 2012. 2012, they were literally reducing the count of IT and staff as they that quadrupled the, the employee count for the company. 
but but again, until well, until all the layoffs started last year, but the tech industry was growing, 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 growing. And the reason was is because in one sector of the tech industry, and this is what I've talked about for a long time, the MCSEs of the world, the A pluses of the world, the CCNAs of the world, right? The value of that massively decreased while the value of God help us all, node developers <laughs> went through the roof, right? UI UX. Most of us did not think about UI UX back in 2010. Nowadays, UI UX is just part of the job skill. And so this is something to think about. Again, if you're thinking about getting into the tech industry, and again, even coding or computer science, is that there is there's more to this. As as jobs leave one area, they really do shift to other areas. And you have to be careful about this whole idea of throwing things entirely out the window. Um, here's what NVIDIA CEO had to say. So this is linked on Twitter. I won't play it because I don't want to get a, a copyright violation here. But basically what he says, and this is cute, watch this video. He says, we are creating the technology so that other people don't know, need to know how to code. Which again is also kind of fascinating there. Oh, so you're, so you're, you're, going, to, you're going to own the means of production. You're going to monopolize the means of production. You are going to build these things that everybody is going to be required to use in order to do anything else. Should I clap now? <laughs> I mean, I'm definitely not a Marxist or anything. <laughs> Anybody that's followed me knows God bless America and capitalism is a pretty cool system. But damn, <laughs> damn. <laughs> I mean, it, the CEO is literally coming out and saying, we are going to create the foundational building blocks of modern economies. <laughs> Don't bother to learn how any of this stuff works. Just use it and pay us rent. Holy crap. Everybody's just eating this crap up too. Ah, right? All, the, all these visionaries, tech professionals, risk takers, they're just eating this up going, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Yeah, that, Jensen Wong. I, I want him to control our world. Anyways, we go down, yeah, over the course of the last 10 to 15 years is what he said. Almost everybody who sits on a stage like this would tell you that it is vital that your children learn computer science. And again, that was also dumb. Not everybody needs to learn to code. Again, I find this fascinating in modern world. I started complaining about this with Obama. Obama came out. It was like, every kid needs to learn how to code. Now, to be clear, Obama did not state every kid needs to understand how our 401k works. Oh, no. <laughs> he did not come out and say every kid needs to know how to be able to change the oil in their car and be able to do basic automobile maintenance. Oh, no, of course not. <laughs> Obama did not come out and say every American needs to know a basic electrician and plumbing skills and other things. Oh, no. Again, the narrative of the time, the narrative of every kid needs to learn to code. Again, and that was stupid. That was stupid too. But again, you say that it's vital for your children to learn to computer science, that everybody should learn how to program. And in fact, it's almost exactly the opposite. It is our job to create, again, it is our job to create computing technology such that nobody has to program and that the programming language is human. Everybody in the world is now a programmer and they will pay us rent. Think for once, for once in your life. Look at something. Do not look between the lines. Don't do additive or anything else. Just look at what the person is saying and realize the evil that lies in there. It is our job, we, to create computing technology such that nobody has to program and the programming language is human. We are going to create it. We are going to own it. You will be subservient to us. Again, that's... That's what this is saying, right? And this is the miracle of artificial intelligence and the miracle of paying rent for basic building blocks of the economy. 
Jensen Huang, NVIDIA co-founder, CEO, and next Satan in chief. And anyways, he goes on this whole idea that you need to specialize in other things, that you should learn science, you should learn science, and you should learn biology, and you should learn engineering, because coding is done, programming is done. Learn these other things. Pay us rent for it, right? But the funny part is, if you look at the other people talking about AI, they're saying that biology is going to go out the window, right? Other people, the AI is going to be able to do a biology. Chemistry. AI is going to be able to do chemistry. You look at all these people talking about what AI is going to do, and basically AI is theoretically going to do everything. Which again, I have a question mark for. Again, it's very fascinating when people talk about AI taking over the world. Is um, You ever notice the people talking about that? You know, they spend their, their lives behind computer screens. Again, there are people that don't change oil on their vehicle or don't know how to do plumbing or don't really deal with other human beings. Because the funny thing is, right, there's this whole idea that AI is going to devastate the world economy. But here's the thing. We don't have enough houses. We don't have enough health care. We don't have enough child care, right? So being here, for whatever reason, in Asheville, people like to come to Asheville and pop out kids. We know a lot of people out that are having kids. And getting them into early childhood education is an absolute abject pain in the ass. Do you think AI is going to solve early childhood education, right? Or basically being able to babysit the kids, change the, change the, uh, uh, the, the diapers and all that kind of stuff, right? But there's this idea AI is going to take over everything. And what I would say here, though, with this guy, with Jensen Huang, basically coming out and saying that you do not need to learn to code. You need to pay him rent. You don't need to learn to code. Basically, what I would bring up here is that the tech industry always changes. One of the things that I find most frustrating about the modern uh, era of technology professionals is that they have been in one paradigm for so damn long that they believe this paradigm is the technology industry. Right, again, you think about it going back to 2008, 2009, when uh, the, 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 uh, the iPhone came out, massive deploy, massive uh, you know, push into to iOS apps and Android apps and web apps, again, UI, UX, JavaScript, Node, all of this kind of stuff. There has been a paradigm in the tech industry of infrastructure as a service, so essentially, generally, AWS, but also maybe uh, Google uh, or Azure, using infrastructure as a service, only pay for it on demand. Again, don't learn how to build servers. <laughs> Don't learn how to rack servers. Don't learn any of that kind of stuff. You're just going to use infrastructure, you know, on demand. Building any of these front end or whatever, you know, apps or whatever else. Uh, and then moving forward, right? Again, Node. Node is the big thing or whatever else. And one of the points that I've been trying to bring up for a long time now was that the tech industry changes. Again, when I got into the Army in 1996, I went through 900 hours of training the Army for my MOS specialty, right? It was electronics. Uh, again, can't really talk about it, but whatever. Uh, basically, but that 900-hour program went through, like seven months of Army training. Just about that. I wasn't with BASIC. The thing was, a year previous, that had actually been two programs. There had been one program uh, that had been something like, I don't know, 33 weeks. And there had been another program that was like 29 weeks. And they mooshed both of those programs together to be like 31 or 32 weeks. Because technology was already changing at that point, back in the 90s, to the point that you could take these entirely separate job specialties, moosh them together, and combining them together ended with an MOS training program that was actually not as long as the longest one before. Uh, two years after I graduated from that MOS specialty, they mooshed it with another job specialty because that was a thing. Technology evolves, and so it becomes easier and easier and easier and easier huh, to maintain stuff. Isn't that funny how that kind of thing was happening back in the 90s, right? But the world changes. Again, we came out with NT4.0. NT4.0 was great for my generation, 24 years old, flying all over the country, doing all kinds of great stuff, right? Because it hadn't been around before, right? We did not have networking to that degree. We did not have internet access and, and email servers and all that kind of stuff. So we go out. And that became the way of things. And then things changed. Things went on. Again, I got fully certified. I have 100 hours in training in, uh, in analog and digital telephone systems, something called Definity systems, Avaya, if you know what the hell that is. Anyways, those are completely worthless. <laughs> those are garbage. 
He's VoIP nowadays, right? But there was a time, again, when I started my career, digital telephone systems were the thing and VoIP was a theoretical concept. Within years, digital systems were garbage and everybody was installing VoIP, right? Things change, you need to move forward. Again, even as a sysadmin, if you look at the sysadmin world of an NT 4.0 versus going into 2000 and 2003, XP in 2003, versus a sysadmin for, for 2008 or 2012, and you compare that then, again, with the world now, with the puppets and the chefs, I guess those aren't as popular, but Ansible, Ansible's a big one right now. When you look at CloudFront, right? So CloudFront is AWS's uh, system for being able to deploy lots and lots of different servers. Again, if you look at the NT 4.0 world <laughs> and you showed them CloudFront, they wouldn't know what the hell to do with it. And I can say that because, again, I was an NT4, you know, MCSE. And you look at CloudFront, like, what, what, what do you mean you're deploying to 500 servers or whatever else? That's just, that's just wackadoodle, right? Things change. Again, as I do these projects with Python now, again, Python interacting with service-oriented architecture, serverless architecture, right? All this kind of stuff. API calls, right? That wasn't, that's what we, what we weren't, what, that's not what we were dealing with 10 years ago. Things change. Our industry moves. And what's weird, can you hear this narrative? And there's a narrative, and then there's a reality. And the narrative is, you know, the tech industry, you know, it's at warp speed. And if you ever stop, you're not going to be able to keep up. And so, yeah, you know, the people in the tech industry, they are just the smartest, fastest runners that are able to keep up with everything going on, right? That's the narrative. There's nothing to do with reality. <laughs> Right, the tech industry is shockingly slow. If you know the concept of legacy infrastructure, you know this, right? Legacy code bases. Again, even if the world is moved on, yeah, it doesn't mean your servers are up to date. Your servers might be boomers. Here's the thing, though. You can insult your servers, and they're not going to care. They're just going to keep doing whatever it is that they're doing. And one of the things that you find is that the tech industry actually does not move that quickly. And so, again, you get a lot of people that get in the tech industry, and then there's this idea of how fast the tech industry moves, and that they're smart, and that they're visionaries, and that they're risk takers. At the exact same time, they're doing incredibly boring garbage work that they were basically doing last year, getting paid a lot of money. And now they have AI coming down the pike. Now they have AI coming down the pike. And here's something scary for tech professionals. It's scary to be dumb again. It's scary to be dumb, right? Because a lot of people that get in the tech industry, why do they get in the tech industry? Because they like feeling smart. Right back when they were a kid, they slapped a ram stick into their mama's computer, and their mom was like, "Wow, my kid's so smart!" And you're like, "Yes, I am." And then you want, right? You want that. It's addictive to feel like you're smart, and so you go and you learn your crappy note or whatever else, and you're like, "Wow, you're smart!" No, you're not. <laughs> you took some time. You learned a skill set most people don't learn. That actually, that, that, is, that is, frankly, overly valued within our society over the past decade. And so you made a lot of money, right? So you learned this skill uh, because people thought you were smart when you learned it. You then go into the job field and you're doing so much better than all the other people that are your age. And so obviously, you're amazing. And then AI comes down the pike. Then AI comes down the pike. And here's a funny thing, and when I talk about AI, I'm actually not anti-AI. I'm actually not not impressed with AI. How do I put that? I actually am impressed with AI. AI is really, really, really cool. And the projects that you can do, everything from machine vision to, to speech, uh, to, to large language models, natural language processing, absolutely fabulous. But again, it's not going to kill coding. It's not going to kill coding. Right, just like serverless architecture hasn't actually killed sysadmins, <laughs> shockingly, right? But it's going to change things 
massively. Again, I've talked with us with some coders who basically now, again, using AI, they're, uh, they're, they're a specialist in one programming language, uh, but now they're able to use AI in order to, to basically solve problems in other programming languages. Again, I talk about this like with myself, I'm not great with JavaScript. Again, I know Python, <laughs> I know Python, I know PHP, yay, anyways, I know Python. <clears throat> JavaScript. Uh, anyways, I got a lot to do. So that's one of the big problems. Like, okay, well, I really know Python, but then going, going from Python to JavaScript is just a whole different world in coding. It's like, oh, I don't have time for this. And so what the cool part is, you can go to AI, <laughs> and you can say, hey, I need to do this in JavaScript. How? And it'll pop out code. And that's the thing. I don't, I don't, I'm not an expert in JavaScript by any stretch of the imagination, but I do know. I can sit there. I can look at that code that pops up. And I can say, okay, this is where the call is being made. This is a return. This is what it's doing with return. Yep, okay, that looks good. And I can plop it in my code. So now the amazing thing is, again, with AI, and these, it's, again, the co-pilot, that kind of stuff, is basically you can now have one coder uh, that's an expert in one particular language, but they're now actually able to create solutions using the other different languages that you need. Again, you may not understand CSS or Tailwind or something like that. You plug a question into uh, to AI, it's able to spit back uh, that response and give you a solution. So what does that really kill, right? Why does that really kill? Does that kill good programmers? Does that kill uh, good technology professionals that are actually trying to solve problems for their bosses or for their clients? Or is that killing the jobs for the hangers on that are simply experts in particular skill sets that you needed to have people with those particular skill sets last year because they knew how to you know, pull data from, from, from a source and send it off to, uh, to, to another location, that type of thing, right? And that's something that you need to think about. And like the, the problem that you're gonna have with a lot of these hangers on is they want, again, they wanna be smart. What is the most important thing is that they are smart. Tell me, daddy, that I'm smart. Again, one of the reasons people don't like me is because no, you're not. <laughs> you got a skill set, you got a skill set, right? And so one of the problems that's coming down the pike is as AI is coming down the pike. You know, AI is a piece of functionality that allows you to deliver more to the end user and allows you to be more efficient. Is that going to kill technology professionals? Absolutely not. Is that going to kill computer programming? Absolutely not. Is it going to make hangers-on basically worthless? Yes. So imagine if you're a hangers-on, hanger-on. Right? You, well, you, you slapped in that RAM chip back, you know, 15 years ago, 10 years ago. You got your job in Node. You're a JavaScript expert. And you're staring down the barrel of AI. And the problem is, you're just not that smart. You're just not that good. Right? You're not really a technology professional, you're a computer flipper. Right? Again, I think about that. Oh, well, why are you a technology professional? That Node person isn't. Again, I started in electronics, got my MCSE and NT 4.0. Again, got certified in telephone systems, digital surveillance system, voice over IP, program. But if you look at my career, right? I've done everything from, from, from cleaning up, you know, spec ops and your, uh, what is it, antenna bags or whatever, a brag. Uh, MCF flying all over the country for MCSE. T had my own business with nine employees. Been doing the tech education and all that kind of thing. You go from one thing to the next thing to the next thing to the next thing. And it happens to be in the world of tech. When one thing becomes obsolete, you roll on to the next thing. We have a lot of these people out there, the node developers or whatever else. No, but this is what they know. And they don't want to be stupid again. <laughs> the thought of being stupid again, right? Which is what happens when you have to learn a new skill set. Again, whether it's going from, from coding to networking, different programming languages or whatever else. Oh, it just melts your poor little brain. And so you can either say, you can either step up, man up and learn the skills that are required in order to continue down this career path. Or you can say your industry is dead. Oh, it's dead. Right? And that's the question that you're gonna figure out, right? You know, as you go forward. 
And I think what's happening right now is, again, you have a lot of coders that are basically saying, you know, this is dead, not because it actually is, but because they don't have the skills and they don't have the interest to move forward. And instead of saying that, they're saying it's dead. And so one of the things I think you need to be thinking about, uh, again, if you're going to be a technology professional, is the whole idea of, um, you know, what solution are you providing to the end user? What problems are you solving? Because if you're focused on finding problems and solving problems, there's always going to be problems that need to be solved. Maybe it's in Node today, maybe it's in Ruby tomorrow, maybe it's some kind of weird ass AI thing a couple of years now, from now. There's always going to be problems that are always going to need to be solved. And at least for our career path or our career lifetime, humans are going to have to sit there and be an intermediary in order to get things accomplished. How is that going to work? Who the hell knows? Again, time moves on. If you look in 2000 and you, you asked me in 2000 what the tech world of 2024 would look like, this is not what I would have thought it would be. Right. And so I think that's a big thing for a lot of folks to start considering. Because, again, one of the big pushbacks I get when I give advice is this whole idea of to be a technology professional, uh, you solve problems with technology. <laughs> Do you know how much pushback I get from that? Ah, oh, I can't believe you with Eli. That's not what a technology professional is. You know, we have a generation uh, of tech professionals who literally don't realize their job is to solve problems. Again, their job is to code, or their job is to, I don't know, nap and eat avocado toast. <laughs> it's not actually to solve problems. And so if you take people who don't view their job as solving problems, and this new technology comes down the pike that's going to, that's gonna, again, upend the apple cart, then they're totally screwed. And so this is something um, that, again, you need to be considered, you need to consider uh, as you're going forward. Uh, with coding, will, will coding change? Yes. But we're still going to need coders, and we're still going to need technology professionals. Again, I have a buddy of mine who's a COBOL programmer. <laughs> they still need COBOL programmers. Why? God knows at this point in time. But that is still actually a viable career track. And uh, I remember back in 2000 when people laughed that they were still using COBOL to program things. And it's 24 years later, right? Because the amazing thing about legacy is legacy never dies. It just keeps trucking along like a zombie. And somebody's got to feed and water that zombie technology. So anyways, and then the final thing to be thinking about with Jensen Huang and these other folks is remember that they're selling a product. They're selling stuff. And think about him. I would not want to be him. Because, again, a lot of people are like, oh, Eli, you're just jealous of him. Oh, hell no. I would not want to be him. You, look at that face. Look at that face. That face is, is the, oh, I am fucked face. <laughs> that is like, oh, I am so screwed, and I don't know what the hell to do face. And, again, that's the other thing. You're like, what? That doesn't even make sense. Eli, Eli, NVIDIA is worth $2 trillion. It's on its way to $3 trillion. What do you mean that's the, oh, crap, I'm screwed face? Well, one of the things I think about is that um, oh, back when I was uh, in college, right, I went through this mythology class. Anyways, after one of the wars, there's some war in Greek mythology, one of them. And uh, afterwards, all like the great thinkers, they were sitting around and they were all moaning. They were all moaning. Oh, woe is us. Oh, woe is us. And again, the professor asked us, why, why are these thinkers for, the, for, for Greece after they just won this war, why are they saying, oh, woe is us? And the reason is, is because when you're at your height, when the economy is the best and you won the war and you're the heroes, there's only one way to go. There's only one way to go from top, right? Down. All right, so these thinkers were like, oh, this is so sad because things have to get worse. And so one of the things uh, you consider when you're looking at Jensen Wong, if you look at their stock price, here, let's actually bring up their stock price. NVIDIA, this is insane. This is insane. Like if we look at their stock price, 
in 2014, in 2014, I don't know if you can see this, it was $4.59 a share. <laughs> you want to talk about a company you wanted to put $10,000 in back in 2014. 2014, $4.59 a share. It is now $781 a share. Again, if we go back to 2019, it was at $37 a share. Uh, at the height, back in 2021, it got up to $303 a share before it fell to $121 in 2022. So in about a year and a half, it's up by five or six times. So again, since 20, October, whatever, 2022, it's gone from 110, let's say, up to 781. It's up by 7x in a year and a half. Oh, that sucks. Oh, that sucks. Because they basically have one product, right? They've got these GPUs. They've got these AI GPUs. This is their product line that right now, right now is incredibly valuable. What happens if technology goes in a different direction? What happens if training models no longer becomes as valuable as it has been? What happens if somebody else, again, comes out with hardware or technology that is better than what NVIDIA offers? Again, there's actually this interesting, a company is now coming out with an LPU. It's a language processing unit. So there's CPUs and GPUs, there's something called TPU, a tensor processing unit, uh, Q, Q, what are the, 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 the QPUs, the, 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 the uh, quantum processing processors for quantum, uh, but they're coming out with an LPU, actually a processor specifically designed for large language models and processing. And so one of the things you have to think about with him, and again, be considering, is he is in a horrible position right now. His company has gone from $4 a share to $781 a share, basically riding this singular wave. Can he possibly, can he possibly pull an Elon Musk? Again, God bless Elon Musk sometimes. <laughs> can he pull an Elon Musk and say, you know, I think our stock's a little overvalued. You think he can pull that crap off? Again, one of the things you got to give Elon Musk is he's the only one that can pull some of the crap off that he does, right? He is sitting on a $2 trillion company and he has, he has to push the idea that this whole model is the absolute future and anything else is stupid. Because if he doesn't push that vision, he is looking at a disaster, abject disaster for his company. And so be careful with this kind of stuff where basically you have these companies that essentially are saying, we are selling the answer. So, you know, everybody else go home. Everybody else can stop working. No, no, you all, you all just stop working and stop doing what you're doing. We already solved the problem. Go home, pay us rent on our idea for the rest of your life. <laughs> go on to do something else. You need to do science. You need to do science. <laughs> Is that, something, is that necessarily something a person from a position of strength would say? Or is that some, something that a person of, oh crap, I have a $2 trillion company, I got to keep this valuation up, would say. So anyways, um, it's just one of those things to ponder. Again, because we've seen this so much, again, whether it's VR, whether it's blockchain, again, now with AI... Again, you have these profit seekers, you have these rent seekers that want to corner the market, tell everybody this is the tech, the end all be all technology. Everybody has to do it, right? And then, and then they're the winner. When again, there's a lot of other stuff going on. It's just not how you know our industry actually works. Uh, so if you've only been in the industry for about ten years, yeah, there's a shakeup going on. There's a shakeup. Uh, things are changing. Things are changing. What was valuable yesterday may not be valuable tomorrow. It's not that the industry is going away. It's that it is massively, massively changing. Uh, and again, and you have to decide uh, whether or not you want to keep up with it. Because I know right now, I know right now, I can hear the snark. I can hear the snark. 
Because some people are going to be like, well, Eli, wait a minute, wait a minute. Didn't Eli do like 500 videos about the IT industry being dead? IT is dead. But now he's doing like Python or whatever. Again, one of the things you have to be thinking about is do you want to stay in the industry? As the industry has changed, do you want to stay in it? Because that's the thing, right? I got my MCSC, again, the whole sysadmin world. And again, that was a good world up until about 2015. <laughs> Uh, 2016, YouTube lost its mind. I went off into fail, fail normal for a while, right? And yeah, I did all these videos about IT being dead. Because again, the A plus is worthless. The, the net plus is eh, useful, I guess. Not to get a job, but you know, for, for, for knowledge. MCSE is now officially gone. I don't even think they have the MCSE anymore. All right, so that whole thing changed. And that was one of the things for me, for my career. Again, do I stay in technology or not? And again, I went off and did fail normal for a while. Like three years, I did fail normal. Wandered, wandered the world, saw things, did videos. Anyways, then you, then you learn like wandering the world actually gets tiring after a while. So eh, fuck it, I came home. Anyways, um, why I'm interested in technology now. Again, I wasn't that interested in technology for a while because I didn't care about mobile app development. Again, for me, and this is something to think about as the industry changes, I don't give a damn. I don't give a damn about mobile development. I don't really care about UI. I don't really care about UX. I don't really care about Swift. Again, I'm a systems guy. Again, whenever you watch my modern videos nowadays, I talk about architectures. I'm really interested in architectures. And so much of the stuff that I knew had friends making money off of. Again, it's just these mobile apps. I didn't care about mobile apps. And that's where I kind of thought, kind of thought my whole day with, uh, day with tech was going to be done. But then the funny thing was, is IoT. IoT has become more and more viable. IoT has become more viable. Serverless architecture is more interesting. Service-oriented architecture is more interesting. And now, again, like with Python, with Py basically with Python, what you do is you can write code in order to build this infrastructure, and you can do some really awesome stuff. So I have a little Raspberry Pi. I can talk to my Raspberry Pi. My Raspberry Pi can actually have like computer intelligence, artificial intelligence. It's all kinds of amazing things. I can build robots nowadays. And that's one of the reasons I'm excited about doing tech now is because kind of like the world of tech and the product that are now on offer have changed back to the point that I'm interested in again. And that's one thing you have to be thinking about. Again, as our industry changes, are you interested in the direction that it's changing into? What bosses, what clients are going to need in five years is not necessarily going to look a lot like what clients and bosses need right now. That doesn't mean the tech industry is dead. It doesn't even mean that you don't need coders. It just means what your job actually is is going to change. And so again, one of the questions for yourself is do you want to move with that change? I know many, many, many tech people that are computer people that have gotten out of the tech industry. Uh, my electrician who charges me through the nose. It was funny, I was talking with him last time he was doing something. He actually has his computer science degree. Literally got his computer science degree, decided he didn't want to sit behind a computer screen all day, and now he's an electrician. Making really good money. I know, I pay him. Holy shit. Have you thought about being an electrician? Think about being an electrician. Anyways, again, electrician, uh, uh, before we moved here, uh, back when we in Baltimore, I had to hire an electrician to do some stuff. Uh, his assistant, his, the electrician assistant, literally I was talking to him, and he had worked for IBM under AI and robotics, but dealing with AI and robotics, decided it was boring, and he also became an electrician. I knew somebody who was in uh, you know, uh, computer science or whatever, went off to build houses. So again, one of the other things to be thinking about, is as your industry changes, again, it's not that coding is going away or anything else, but do you, do you want to move with the industry as it does? And again, this doesn't necessarily mean the industry is over. It does mean you don't necessarily want to go with it. And these are some of the things to be thinking about because our industry changes. What I did 30 years ago does not look like what I did 20 years ago. Does not look like what I did 10 years ago. Does not look what I did today. If I was trying to deploy things based off of, you know, what we did 15 years ago, it would be absurd, absurd, right? Because things change. So anyways, there you go. There are some thoughts. There are some things to think about. Uh, mamas, don't let your, your babies grow up to be Jensen Huang's. <laughs> you, don't, you, don't, you don't want to be that miserable. <laughs> Look into those eyes. Look into those poor little eyes. That is the most miserable bastard I've ever seen. <laughs> like, oh my God, my company's worth two trillion dollars. Fuck. <laughs> no! Uh, where 
do you go from there? Where do you go from there? Uh, so anyways, some things to ponder, some things to consider. Uh, if you do like hanging out and building stuff or whatever, uh, just so you know, I do do these pub hacks. Um, so every Tuesday here in Asheville, North Carolina, at a place called Wedge and Foundry, we're doing pub hacks. We just did our like our seventh or eighth one. They're pretty fun. Basically, you come together uh, and we all build our projects. So the idea is, hey, people are geeks are building things. So let's come together and build stuff together. So people could build their stuff and they explain what they're building and they drink beer and we eat ch the chili cheese fries. It's a pretty good old time. Uh, it's under Silicon Dojo. Yeah, Silicon Dojo might be dead. <laughs> Anyways, we'll talk about that later. But we are doing pub hacks. So if you're interested in this, uh, go to Meetup. Take a look for Silicon Dojo and uh, sign up for one of these things if you want to come to it. Um, and what else? It's really about a guy. That's about all I have to say. Um, so yeah, as always, I enjoy these doing these types of videos for you folks. Just be thinking about this again. Don't take my word for it. Ah, Eli, why should we believe you? Oh, you shouldn't. You shouldn't believe anybody. Distrust, verify, stay suspicious. Right? Don't trust anybody. Read everything for yourself. Learn for yourself, and then ask. Ask whether the current narrative makes in half an ounce of sense. And what you find most of the time, again, this is just, it's just clickbait. The problem that we're getting right now with clickbait is clickbait is making it too far into the mainstream. So people are agreeing with this horse crap. So anyways, I enjoy doing this video. <laughs> See you at the next one.